Down wintry mix today. I didn't get out there in the snow. Oh, raining, freezing rain. But it's a beautiful winterscape here at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. News conference here at the Hall of Fame tomorrow. We'll speak to all three. Here are the results. Adrian Beltre, Todd Helton, Joe Maurer getting into the Hall of Fame, getting over the 75% needed. Billy Wagner, five votes shy. He has one more shot next year. Gary Sheffield, that was year 10. He goes to the Veterans Committee. He'll be eligible in a few years, but he falls short. Andrew Jones, Carlos Beltran again. We'll talk A-Rod and Manny. And Chase Utley down uh, just below 29%. Jay Jaffe of Fangraphs uh, wrote the Cooperstown Casebook. He follows us very closely. He's been on the show many times. Jay, great to have you back on the show, especially on today where we had such a nice result. Hey, thanks, Brian. It's always great to be back. Jay, give me your overall thoughts on the voting results, especially we were just talking about uh, J Jason Stark and I mainly saying there has been an evolution in the voting. I don't know if it's a, a revolution, but there seems to be some changes. Your read on that. Yeah, I think that I, I think we've seen an evolution over time. We've seen uh, high peak candidates and candidates whose uh, cases are more supported by um, advanced statistics than necessarily by the traditional milestones of uh, uh, 300 wins or 500 home runs uh, get traction in, in the Hall of Fame voting. And I think that's that's a positive. Um, careers are not the same. The game itself has changed considerably. And, and you know, the way it's the way that teams uh, run the run run the game are, has has changed as well. So I think, our, you know, as voters, we need to evolve to reflect that. Um, you know, pitchers are viewed differently. Position players are viewed differently. Defense is viewed differently. I think all that's important to incorporate into our analysis. Um, given that these guys were just off the field and they were, uh, you know, objectively great players while they were playing, it wasn't that long ago, why do you think Joe Maurer's brand seemed to be so high and Chase Utley's brand, I wouldn't say was low, but not as high? Why would that be? Well, I think if you look back at their careers, Maurer was honored in his time for uh, the things that he did, the ways, you know, the, the way that he, that he was, uh, um, you know, his production was interpreted. I mean, he was an MVP. He was a batting champion, uh, two-time on-base champion, slash stat, triple crown winner, uh, you know, seven all-star appearances, three gold gloves. Utley, you know, was, was pro outproduced in terms of war, both Jimmy Rollins and Ryan Howard, when they won MVP awards, he never got a, you know, barely a sniff in the MVP voting. He never won a gold glove despite very strong defensive metrics. He was just a little bit underappreciated in his day. Right, and yet what you're saying, right, when you dig a little deeper and you kind of look at the expen exponentiality of the whole uh, game with Utley with his defense and his base running and the hitting, especially at his position, as you said, when you look at the war, Chase Utley had a higher wins above replacement than Joe Maurer. So that you, you're naming a lot of old school stuff with Maurer. I, is that the answer? That No, he had the old school well, markers. I, I, Chase you know, Utley did not. Actors Catcher's production is constrained by their playing time, and Maurer had a had a short career even for a catcher, catching 921 games before the concussions forced him to move to first base. Um, you know, so I don't think you could do a direct comparison uh, of the, of their offensive statistics and have it be a fair one. Um, you know, that said, on the other hand, Utley's uh, uh, Utley's base running was a big. Uh, part of his value, Maurer doesn't really have that. Few catchers do, but I mean, you know, he did win the batting titles because he was able to leg out some of those hits. Um, so it, it, it's very, it's it's a it's very much an apples to oranges connect uh, uh, comparison when you're talking about a catcher versus a second baseman. Okay, I I see them much more closer than that. I I, I see the real similarities, just in the level of greatness. But I, I understand what you're saying. Do you think that the it's 10 years now. Do you think year 10 kind of forced uh, Gary Sheffield voters to give him that surge and next year will force Billy Wagner? Or, or do you think we would have just been doing this in year 15? I'm just wondering, like, with another year, would Gary Sheffield have gotten in? Or no, you just would have postponed this last year to five years from now? Yeah, I think, you know, with Gary Sheffield, I think... Because of the Balco connection, even though he was not considered a culprit, he was considered a witness, you know, and it wound up in the Mitchell report. I think that placed a hard cap on his support. And, um, you know, the fact that Gary Sheffield was, I, I think, occasionally a difficult uh, uh, player for the for his teams uh, and for his managers some, and general managers sometimes may have also had, had an impact as well. I mean, 
you know, he wasn't shy about stating his opinion and airing his grievances. I think maybe there's some of that there. But I do think that um, because he was linked to bonds and to PEDs, there was a hard cap on his support. And he was probably not going to get in by this process uh, one way or another. Whereas Billy Wagner, I think there's still uh, a very good chance he gets in. Um, you know, the analytics have, I think, shown just how strong he is. And he doesn't have that kind of built-in resistance, although there are certainly people who are unwilling to consider anybody with as few innings as he had. Um, I think that's uh, a smaller group than the uh, no PEDs ever uh, cluster of voters. Right. I, give me something on Todd Helton then, because Helton, did he get aided by Larry Walker finally breaking through, where there seemed to be almost an overcompensation for Coors Field? Yeah, I think I think he was certainly helped by, by the recognition of Walker, and I think maybe uh, people, you know, voters, uh, including you know, and, and, and audiences, saw that the way that uh, uh, you know that we, using advanced statistics we can adjust for Coors Field, um, you know, helped the analysis of both. I mean, let's let's also remember that that Todd Helton was a very good fielding first baseman, won a few Gold Gloves, uh, has positive defensive value. Walker, of course, was a great. Uh, defender and a great base runner. So, you know, the fact that uh, these guys were more than just um, course, you know, productions of Coors Field's uh, favorable offensive environment, um, and that for Helton, uh, he, you know, his, his fielding value gave him uh, a bit of a, a softer floor uh, when he was going through his decline phase. I think all of that helped him. Okay, uh, something interesting from your ballot, Andy Pettit, right? Now, there's kind of an, your anomalous pick. Uh, give me something on Andy Pettit and how you made that choice. Well, you know, at first I wanted to do somebody who I, I really enjoyed, like Bartolo Colon. I thought about David Wright as well. Um, but when I thought about Colon, I was like, you know, Andy Pettit's got much stronger run prevention numbers, much bigger postseason footprint. And look, going back to my days as a fan, I really enjoyed watching Andy Pettit pitch. Uh, I'm not nearly as bothered by uh, his admission of using HGH before uh, MLB had its full program in place as I am by Bartolo Colon's um, uh, PED suspension from 2012. So um, in the end, I landed on Pettit. I, I think we really do need to have a conversation, an extended conversation about uh, what our expectations are for Hall of Fame pitchers uh, and, and, and their production, given that we're not going to have very many of them, many of them, even with Pettit's innings total, um, you know, and, and win total and, and war total coming down the line. I mean, you look at today's pitchers besides Kershaw, uh, Scherzer, Granke, and Verlander, uh, there's really nobody who looks like anything close to a lock for the Hall of Fame uh, or any who's going to meet anything close to those, those kinds of numbers. So I think we maybe have to start accepting uh, that the Pettits and the Burleys and maybe the Tim Hudsons, who we'd like to go back and look at, uh, are guys that uh, uh, we should be giving stronger consideration. Right, excellent points, and, and I, I'm with you on Pettit. Like you know, uh, you know that the PED thing, you get lied to an awful lot. There are some players you can make a distinction and say, you know what, I think he's telling the truth. It's possible with Pettit or Sheffield, it's possible. And but Pettit, I think, has a, a fairly strong case. Uh, good job, Jay Jaffe. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Brian.